Uh, so now we're going to shift away uh, a little bit from the sort of more technical subsurfacey part to more of this sort of unstructured documents that we are also struggling with. We've seen a lot of the issues we have with data. Uh, what about all the documents, the hidden PDFs, the gazillions of files that we have? Can we get more sense out of that? And so I'm, it's a pleasure to in introduce Paul Cleverly, who's a geoscientist by background, now an information scientist. He's an associate lecturer at the Robert Gordon University. There he comes. Um, he's on the board on the non-profit academic published cooperative Geoscience World, an industry researcher and corporate consultant. Paul's passion is in text analysis and machine learning, exploiting unstructured information. And his talk is, uh, can machines read like a geoscientist does? So. Thank you. Well, delighted to, to be here to share some findings of uh, some exploratory research uh, that I've been doing looking at uh, text analytics uh, in uh, geoscience. So a little bit of, a, little bit of fun, uh, just looking at... Um, a bit of a play on Asimov, Turing, and uh, Elul of the three laws for, for text analytics. So based on the question, can machines read uh, text like geoscientists do? So the first law is the law of non-equivalence. So machines can't read text like geoscientists because they're not geoscientists. They have their own biases, strengths, and weaknesses, which are different from our own, uh, and that can be useful. The second law is the law of cognitive limitations. For every geoscientist, whether you're exploration, uh, development, production, there's literally too much information to read, both inside the organization uh, and the external literature. So we are limited by our own uh, cognitive abilities, uh, and that presents a use case for text analytics. And the third law is the, the law of uh, inflated expectations. And it's likely that technological propaganda, technological <coughs> solutionism, will mean that for some of us, some of the time, we might forget about law number one. So it's a little bit of a, 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 it's a bit of fun, uh, and you'll see some of these concepts uh, through the, uh, the presentation. So really setting the scene, I mean, we're all aware of our cognitive biases. So the individual biases, such as confirmation bias, where we have tendencies to seek out or cherry pick information to justify what we already believe. Then we've got social biases like groupthink, where you can put people together and you can reach, uh, can reach conclusions through consensus rather than independent critical thinking. And these have, have been shown to be detrimental uh, to decision making. And then you have this construct of big data. On one hand, capable of overwhelming information overload, but as we've seen uh, on some of the earlier presentations, also fascinating levels uh, of information discovery. And some people seeing big data predominantly about compute power, and other people see it's predominantly about brain power. We only have so much time, so many questions we can ask. Uh, what, what do we choose uh, to ask? But either way, it's likely to be about small patterns and how we exploit those small patterns uh, for our benefit. So in amongst all this text, can we apply algorithms that surface patterns that challenge what we know and perhaps show us what we don't know? That doesn't mean if we see patterns that are different to our mental models that we're wrong, but just simply being aware of this vast stacked opinion of thousands of, of authors, the averages, the outliers, uh, in volumes too, too large for us to ever read, in PowerPoints, in Word, uh, in, in PDF, may just uh, uh, stop, uh, make us think about what we know. So I'm just gonna cover three areas very quickly. Can't, can't obviously cover, it's a very large area, um, but just looked a little bit rules-based, then unsupervised machine learning and supervised machine learning. So this is probably the most common use of text analytics, which is extraction. So this is using 100 years of the Society of Economic uh, Geology, so many, many thousands of, of PDF uh, articles in the literature. And what you're seeing on the first diagram is uh, picking out geological time, so you've given a lookup list, uh, or it could be a set of NLP rules, a pattern you're looking for. Uh, and you can see there in association with other geographical terms which you could have taught the machine through just providing uh, lookup lists. So based on actually something that, that goes back to the 1950s, the distributional hypothesis from Harris, words that occur close together share some uh, semantic meaning. So we can use some associative information and then plot that geographically uh, to surface information that otherwise 
uh, visually we wouldn't be able to see because it's, it's buried within uh, documents. And then on the far side, same sort of techniques, but this time we're looking at extracting numerical data, so integers, floats, uh, not through tables in this example, but through inline text. So we're looking through a pattern, PPM for parts per million, then looking around that for uh, an integer or float, and also a chemical element. So we're extracting numerical data uh, there, which may not exist in any particular structured data uh, database that, that we have. Uh, some people refer to this as dark uh, data, uh, which, which can be useful. And a lot of these uh, techniques in the, in the academic world have been driven through GeoDeep Dive, which is uh, an initiative out of the University of Wisconsin, which allows mining of vast amounts of geoscientific literature for uh, academic uh, purposes. Uh, and there's been lots of papers that have come out, uh, come out of that uh, with new scientific discoveries. So, for example, the stromatolite populations are always thought to be related in some way to mass extinction events. But using some techniques like this, there's some papers that now seem to provide evidence it's more related to seawater chemistry. And there's many others around supercontinent assembly uh, and other examples where the patterns in the whole of, of, of this collection um, are greater than the sum of the parts. What you can find in an individual document uh, or, or within uh, a subcollection. So this is great, and I'm sure almost uh, every operator or service company is doing these sorts of extractions and also on images. Uh, but what else can we do? So just give a, a couple of other uh, examples. So this is uh, unsupervised learning. So imagine you have a corpus of text, and in it you have extracted lithostratigraphic formations by a rule such as extract the nouns that occur before the word formation with a capital F, uh, or before the word member with a capital M. Um, so perhaps you don't have a, a lookup list to identify those entities. What we can do is look at, uh, at the words around those entities as they appear in text and count them. Uh, so, so creating a, a mathematical vector uh, for that text. And why would we want to do that? Because we can compare uh, the words using the words around those entities, one entity uh, to another. So we might have a question, which is the most similar uh, uh, formation here to the green formation? What we've got here is green, Bino, and Nemo, uh, invented names here. Imagine there's thousands of these. I'm only just showing three. Then you've got the words that occur around these entities. Again, I've only shown three, but imagine you've got thousands of these. So you can simply do, and i just just go very quickly through it. It's a distributional counting. So it's one of the simpler ones, but I think it sort of helps understand, for people not familiar with word vectors, how you can use a cosine to, to compare similarity. So if we want to compare the green and the Beno formation, we effectively just calculate the, the cosine between them. So um, 5 times 0 plus 3 times 1 plus 2 times 2 divided by the square root of the green formation, 5 squared plus 3 squared plus 2 squared times the square root of the Beno formation, 0 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared, which gives us 0 0.2075. Now, if we had exactly the same words, exactly the same quantities, we'd get 1, which would be uh, an identical uh, comparison. So this is saying, for example, in the shore face, that word occurs five times around the green, or green formation, but not at all in the corpus we're looking at uh, around the Beno formation. So we can do the same, uh, comparing the green formation to the Nemo, and we end up with 0.733. So we can infer from this that the Nemo is more similar uh, to the uh, green formation than uh, the Nemo. So taking this a little bit further, we can develop a search-based application. So instead of giving us documents back, it gives us entities. And this concept of, of uh, things, not strings, has, has been around for many years. Um, simply using uh, aspects like that cosine similarity uh, as a suggestion for an analog. So in areas of sparse data, uh, when you're looking for, uh, you know, what is the most uh, similar to, to this, or you, you say, I'm looking for uh, uh, a volcanic sandstone that's been fractured, etc., it'll just come back with the best answer it can. It doesn't mean it's, it's the most optimal. Uh, and this is quite useful for analogs because in a normal keyword search, you don't know what they are, so you can't actually search on them. Um, there's a variety of techniques. I've uh, uh, experimented with uh, word to vec which is uh, uh, a, a probabilistic uh, text embeddings, which is more of a prediction model. Um, there's loads of different ones you can do. And I, I, I'm testing with geoscientists because there's so many different things you can do, so many algorithms, so many hyperparameters. It's useful to uh, video record geoscientists interacting, uh, an interview and survey to understand which are some of the more important aspects. And there's some evidence that even in a collection of information that people know, these techniques are possible to surface uh, analogs uh, which are useful and valuable that 
uh, geoscientists wouldn't have necessarily known about. So this is using the latent pattern in text, effectively a complex word co-occurrence uh, mechanism. So there's no rules uh, in here. This is really just a sort of conceptual example to show that we can then combine the word vectors in text with structured data that we have in a database. So this is, again, back to that 100 years' worth of Society of Economic Geologists. Each of the blue circles is a U.S. state, so Wyoming, Utah, etc. And you're looking at the x-axis, the cosine similarity to the word vector of arsenic. Then on the y-axis, we've got rainfall data um, out of uh, one of the U.S. Uh, sort of governmental databases. It is, a weak, it is a weak correlation, of course, correlation is not causation. But there is a mechanism here. As pH goes up, uh, arsenic is more likely to mobilize out of the rocks um, and into the groundwater. So, you know, if, if, if we can see patterns which we know there are existing mechanisms for and theories, maybe we can also identify things which uh, are, are new uh, in terms of our, our, our overall uh, knowledge. So this is just an example of using text and structured data together. Uh, rather than just uh, mining text as a sort of standalone uh, entity. So last example is uh, supervised uh, uh, machine learning. So there, as, as we've been through several examples already, sort of labeling things, whether those are images, objects, or, or, or text, or documents. In this case, um, I purposely sampled uh, some public domain petroleum system reports and extracted out uh, sentences that contain a petroleum system element, like trap, uh, source rock, seal, reservoir, etc. So generated quite a few thousand sentences. And I then provided those to retired geologists to label from the perspective of an exploration geoscientist whether they thought they were positive, uh, negative, or neutral. Um, what was interesting is there was over 90% agreement uh, amongst the retired geologists, which I thought was unusual because geologists are not the most agreeable uh, of people. I, 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 obviously say that as a geologist. So, so that was interesting. But as people have said before, it's not 100%. So whenever you're comparing anything against the human standard, then people won't agree with each other. So um, it's very important to, to bear that in mind when you're looking at how, how well uh, a classifier can, can perform. So 20% of that labelled examples held back to test set, 80% used as part of a machine classifier, in this case, uh, Naive Bayes, uh, with also some lexicon uh, data. So uh, there are a lot of lexicons around uh, sentiment analysis, uh, but what you find is that if you look at them, you'll, you'll see words like fault, old, thick, expelled, all have negative uh, sentiment. And of course, just something being thick in geology uh, doesn't necessarily mean that's, that's bad. So uh, those, were, those were adjusted uh, to make them more geoscience uh, uh, specific. So here's just a few examples of sentences you get a feel for how the, the retired geologists label them. So first one, characterization of fluvial, fluvial and aeolian reservoirs. That was rated as neutral. Uh, very important to get that neutral category. The second one, source rocks are thought to have expelled oil after trap formation. Uh, that was rated as positive. Uh, third one, reservoir sands are not a problem in this area. Also rated positive. This one's a good example of word order. Um, so a normal naive base or bag of words model treats each word uh, uh, independently. Um, so the word not and problem, you might say, have negative tendencies, but because they put them together, they're positive. So word order is a very important element to, to include in, uh, in sentiment analysis. And then the last one here, just as an example of negative, shows several attractive fault-related traps, but sedimentological and stratigraphic studies indicate that it would be poor reservoir characteristics. This is just a good example of a pivot. So uh, dependency-like uh, passing, where you can pick up pivots in sentences uh, and that can uh, enhance uh, your sentiment uh, analysis. And there are other things I don't have time to, to go on to, things like disambiguation, uh, for example, uh, of word meaning. So just a few uh, results of that. The control here on the far left is Senti WordNet. So Senti WordNet is um, where WordNet from Princeton, which is over 100,000 words in the English language, have been labelled as the polarity of, of that word. Uh, that was just put straight into a... Uh, naive Bayes against the test set, and that test set I put in GitHub, it's 750 labelled examples of positive, negative, and neutral sent sentiment related to Patron systems, so you can, you can test uh, using that um, qu quite low. And then in the middle, um, the 80% of those uh, uh, trained examples uh, into a text embedding uh, shallow neural network um, model, and then compared to Naive Bayes. And what's interesting is the simpler 
when in this case, okay, it's a small, uh, obviously a small volume of data, uh, outperforms. Uh, and this actually supports uh, some research by Wang and Manning uh, uh, from Stanford that looked at when you're dealing with small snippets of information like sentences or bullets in PowerPoint, generative machine learning techniques uh, tend to outperform more sophisticated discriminatory uh, techniques uh, such as SVM, etc. So that was an interesting one. And then on the far right is the combination of adding the, the lexicon as well as the trained uh, machine learning data. This is for uh, the two categories, uh, positive uh, and negative. Just looking at what's available on the web, there are a lot of sentiment APIs uh, uh, that, that, that are available. So uh, I tested using uh, what's available on the web for some of, some of the large technology vendors, bearing in mind that a lot of the, the training there probably uses Rotten Tomatoes, movie reviews, uh, and other sort of techniques. Some of them didn't cater for word order. Um, but you can't be really, uh, like in most machine learning, the specificity of your training set uh, when it comes to, to, to accuracy. And, and again, this is a well-documented uh, in other industries. Uh, the American Red Cross took a one of the best commercial products uh, and deployed it on their text. Uh, and only found 21% of their positive comments. So th there is this customization that's needed around uh, sentiment uh, analysis. And there's the, the test set in, in GitHub if you want to test uh, your own uh, sort of sentiment analysis. So why would you bother d doing this? Whenever we do any literature review or analysis, we're always interested in contradictions. So uh, thing, t two different things which, which can't be logically correct saying about the same element. So this is taking U.S. geological survey reports by Basin uh, and then looking at the sentiment around each petroleum system element, uh, the ratio of positively negative. So you can see for this particular basin over here, uh, a lot of red. We didn't show up so much red on, on, on here, but uh, the red for the reservoir and seal, a bit more positivity around the charge. And you can see it differs in, in different areas. And this might stimulate the geoscientist if they see something that doesn't fit their mental model to go and drill down to see that specific information. So uh, some research that, that I've done looking at search facets is um, understanding that a lot of what subject matter experts want to, to be is be surprised by the system. Let the system show them something they don't already know. Um, uh, and some very early findings about a comment from uh, a geologist here about it would be good to sort of see, take the whole of the AAPG and, and test you know, what we think we know against what this, this body of literature is, is showing us. So that's good timing, it's my last slide. Um, obviously text and extraction uh, is, 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 we should be doing it on probably a much larger scale, um, but there's other things to do. So uh, for narrow tasks, um, machine learning can produce human-like uh, 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 quality in terms of accuracy uh, if it's a narrow task. Uh, and for analogs, I think an area of, of, of interesting research is we can classify similarity by so many different dimensions. You know, we're all similar groups here because of, of gender or some people wear glasses or age, etc. So what are the similarity dimensions that people are interested in for analogs uh, and in what context? Uh, and so a, a big element of uh, the, the research that I've been doing is to, is to test it with geoscientists. So uh, record them interacting on touch screens and with other data to try and understand what it is that grabs uh, people's attention and why. Uh, so that's all I have. I, I put a lot of information on the blog uh, if you want to drill down into some of this detail. So th thank you for listening.